is Professor Alex Lima from Queen's College who will talk about very interesting machine generated theorems in projective geometry. As usual, when we have a speaker from our town, there's a dinner in the usual place, Emily, at 6.45. If you'd like to join us, please let me know. Everybody's welcome, but let me know immediately after the talk I'm standing here and I'll be taking names. Thank you. And reminding you, absolutely no cell phones or no texting or whatever uh, during the talk, next 48 minutes. Okay, well, first of all, um, projective geometry in the title you can ignore. It just means high school geometry. <laughs> but if you heckle me and say, what well, happens if both lines are parallel, I'll say, we're in projective geometry, they meet at infinity. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, projective geometry has no meaning beyond everyone knows. <coughs> um, incidence fit. So the talk is on machine generation of incidence fits in projective geometry. I've got rid of projective geometry. How about incidence fits? <coughs> So um, I think the best way to tell you is to show you an example. So let me show you the oldest and simplest incident sphere, as far as I know. And I'm going to give you a statement from Wikipedia. I decided I would cheat and look it up on Wikipedia. So this is Pappas' sphere. And I remember seeing this when I was in high school. I read some geometry book by someone called Forda, which was quite a good book. But I didn't like Pappas' mm -hmm. <laughs> And When I saw this on Wikipedia, I said exactly the same thing. So given collinear points, <coughs> Wikipedia says, given one set of collinear points, and another set of collinear points, of this, which I think is still not much better. So we have two lines with collinear points, A, B, and C. Equal space. This is projective geometry. There's no such notion. What are we supposed to do? A, A B intersect B A. I think Wikipedia made lots of bad choices in this statement. Usually Wikipedia is good in mathematics, but this one is not one of its better efforts. Why is A C intersect? You can make it better than so. guarantees to us that these three points have to line up. That's Pappas' sphere. Okay, and this is a typical incident sphere. It describes combinatorial properties that you get by joining points and intersecting lines. Okay, so there's the theorem. The next simplest incident sphere, and the next one was Desargues' 1636 theorem, 
which is irrelevant to us today, so I'll be able to deal with this answer. Okay, but however, I think this statement of Pappas from Wikipedia is so bad <laughs> that I'm going to have to restate it for you. Okay, I, I find that absolutely unmemorable. I have to look at a piece of paper to see what you're intersecting. I, I also don't have very good intuition about why this should be the case. With a lot of geometry, we can see intuitively why it should be true. I find incidence theorems rather hard, which is why I ended up getting my machine to do it for me. But anyway, let me restate this so at least I can remember it, and hopefully you can remember it. So here's Pappas' theorem again. So if the vertices of a hexagon lie alternately on two lines, then the points of intersection Theorem, but this is just a better way to write it. So here's my hexagon. I'm going to call it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's obviously a hexagon. So vertex 1, vertex 2, vertex 3, vertex 4, vertex 5, vertex 6. It's not a convex hexagon. <laughs> it's never been a convex hexagon. You get three of them. Versus line to line. But um, let's have a look. Opposite sides. 1, 2 is opposite to halfway round 6 is 4, 5. 1, 2 intersect 4, 5. So that's 1, 2 intersect 4, 5. 2, 3 intersect 5, 6. 3, 4 intersect 1, 6. Same theorem. This is a much better way to state it. I believe I can remember this. It's a better way, but it's not historically accurate, probably. probably. I don't think I. Probably, probably has I may well way. be the only person who states it this way, <laughs> but um, it's just so superior. To <laughs> go hey, actually, but don't blame Wikipedia, blame Papus. Blame followers who wrote the book, but it was probably <laughs> copied <it> from. Um, <coughs> I mean, I wasn't planning to talk about this. This is another subject entirely. Mm -hmm. But I sometimes teach geomet college geometry courses, and students are very bad at stating theorems. And I told them that I now know a good statement of a theorem is expressed in abstract concepts. A bad statement uses notation. This is entirely abstract. It's a good statement. This writer, you have to know A, B, and to say B, A. And at that point, it's bad. And so my rule for a good statement really is a correct rule for what's a theorem. If you can't write it like that, it's probably only a lemma. But anyway, um, that, that's irrelevant to us today. But this is the first example of an instance theorem. And I want to know more instance theorems because there are lots of them. <coughs> OK, so I, oh, and before I get on to more, I, I skipped a Zarg's theorem, which is an instance theorem. This statement also connects Pappas' theorem to Pascal's theorem. And Pascal's theorem is tangentially relevant. So I'll show you Pascal's theorem. Pascal's theorem isn't a pure instance theorem because it involves a conic. But Pascal's theorem says if hexagon is inscribed in a conic, then the points of intersection of opposite sides are collinear. Pascal's theorem dates from 16, 
69 when he was 16 years old. Okay, and Pascal's theorem, I'll just draw you a little picture of a hexagon inscribed in an ellipse, but it's the same thing. And then you can see the two theorems are very closely related. Okay, why is Pascal's theorem tangentially relevant? Well, I did, I wrote my program after working with John Conway. We were looking at instance theorems that stem from the Pascal configuration. So we took the Pascal configuration, joined up vertices that appeared intersected lines, and we produced an enormous number of instance theorems. We got good at predicting them, and proving them was tricky, so we wrote a computer program that proved all our theorems. We wrote a couple of papers. The papers cover up the fact that every proof in there was machine generated. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's another story. I see my screen has gone off. Um, I won't go into our program, but towards the end of that project, I realized I could write a sister program that didn't prove theorems. It told us what the theorems were, so it sort of conjectured the theorems. I could have linked it to the first program and got proofs as well. In fact, I never bothered, but the theorems were so obviously correct that I didn't try to prove any of them until preparing for this talk. So let me tell you, so I'm going to tell you about that program. Okay, I, I'm going to run it for you, and I'm going to run it in a special setup. It works fairly generally, but the version that I tested, the version I'll talk to you about, examines the setup of incident <coughs> theorems that stem from five points, A, B, C, D, E. So we begin with five points. instance theorems. So we join them up, we intersect lines we make, and we see what combinatorial properties show up. So we use these as ingredients. This is sort of the first fertile set of ingredients you can use, and it's the smallest, and so that allows the machine to go first. That's one. But I've also, I'm about to show you my program. I'm going to run it. It's going to make theorems for us. Where's my program? You can see it's here. It's from the package 5. And you can see I've got a parallel package called 6. <laughs> so although I'm not going to talk about it today, I have run this on other configurations. Over 7, 8, 9, 10. 6. I mean, it, it would run on those two. It, say it could work in other situations. But it's interesting already on five points. Okay, and so what am I going to let the computer do? It's going to join them up with lines. So it will join points. Okay, and it has to tell me what it's doing, and it uses this notation to make a line. So for example, it will write AB for the line joining points A and B, if it wants to tell me about that line. So it uses sort of straight brackets for lines, and it can intersect lines. Which I will, when you intersect lines, you get a point, so I use pointy brackets. And I guess this notation may well be influenced by John. And so it will write stuff like that when it wants to talk about a point. And if these are things that it could talk about. Okay, and then it will mean more complicated things, like the line joining A to the intersection of B, C. So that's one of the next generation of objects that we'll consider. Okay, and it's going to tell me anything interesting 
it finds. So I have to tell you how it decides its name. I used this one, didn't I? I did it right, but I forgot to close the bracket. I should say, this program was written down in an afternoon. It was sort of fairly lazy. It's never been rewritten. And the program had to parse expressions. And so, whereas it would have been nicer to write a line like this, that would have made parsing it a bit harder. So, it used lazy notation and it printed its working notation. So, I apologize for not making this as best as possible, but that's how it is. Okay, now, what does it do? Well, we should notice the symmetric group S5. There will be line yes. brackets. It should really be. John would have made me use line brackets. But so this was as close to line brackets as I could get. The S5 permutes A, B, C, D, and E. And so it permutes the objects we can create out of it. So if I apply, let's pick a nice permutation, say I do B, D, C, E, I can apply that permutation to this object, and it will produce me the object where A is joined to the intersection, I have to swap B and D, I have to swap C and E. Okay, so this element of the symmetric group will transform this recipe to that recipe. And if you're mildly awake, you'll see they're the same thing. Because intersecting BC with DE is the same as intersecting DE with BC. Okay, so elements fix a recipe belong to the combinatorial stabilizer, because we can just see combinatorially that they don't change anything. <clears throat> okay, now obviously whatever points we use for A, B, C, D, and E, we'll get the same answer for these computed objects out of the points. So it's the, co the combinatorial stabilizer stabilizes the recipe, and it stabilizes the objects we produce. There's also a geometric stabilizer. intersect some lines, get a result, and how can we permute the ingredients we get the same result? Okay, it's obvious that anything in the combinatorial stabilizer is in the geometric stabilizer. This one, you know, if you fix the recipe, you must be fixing the result. Okay, and in this case, the geometric stabilizer is the same. Combinatorial stabilizers and geometric stabilizers. Maybe if I finish before a rank well in time in front of 48, I'll show you how it computes it. But it, it can compute it, it's not very difficult. And it usually they're the same. Where they're different, you discover an interesting fact. The two objects are really the same, but you can't predict it combinatorially. They're the same because of geometric reasons. And that better claim is a theorem. And so the program is going to detect its theorems 
by detecting when the geometric stabilizer is bigger than the combinatorial stabilizer. Not obvious it will happen at all, but it does. So I think now let me let the program talk to you. Let me show you. It, you know, seeing the program operate gives you an idea for what it's doing and how it's doing it. So it, let me run it. it. I mean, this program was very easy. It's thrown together in an afternoon. It's a piece of Java. It's also fast. I'm running it in Eclipse, which taxes the program. And I don't care. It's fast enough. Okay, so let's see what it's doing. So it goes generation by generation. It pauses till I tell it I want to go on to the next generation. It's not thinking. It said, okay, I've looked at generation one. I started with A, B, C, D, and E. I started with your five points. Generation one is A, B, C, D, and E. And it says nothing to me because there was nothing interesting to say. It, it gives me something. It says there's one type of point found so far, something like A, B, C, D, or E. No types of lines. It, it counts um, up to orbits of S5. So it's quit to all type anything else if you want to continue. Well, I want to see some more. I want it to give me a theorem. So let's do Don't you have five points to begin with? Denise and Dion? What's that? Don't you have five points? Oh, it's it's got, but oh, I, I, I want to look. I, I can't, it counts classes on their equivalence of the group S5. Because basically, there's no difference between A and B and the group yeah. and So it, it, it's counting orbits of a group that. We don't need to worry too much about that. So let's say go on, let's have a look one step further. So it's going to make generation two. Generation two. We take points and we join them up. It makes lines. It makes lines like A, B. And it says, what well, it says, there's one type of point, one type of line, and it's not said anything else, so it didn't find anything else remotely interesting. There's nothing interesting to say about the line A, B. Okay, let's push it a bit further. Generation 3. Two types of point. So it's found points like, and I won't quite use the computer notation because we can still understand that the intersection of A, B, and C, D. That's another type of point. It's uninteresting. It also looked at this. You know, that's the recipe it could have formed, but it discarded that. Because we can all see AB meets AC at A. And the computer says it, it keeps like a list of what it's found so far. It says I found that already. I'm not going to waste my time considering a complicated recipe for it. So if that was discarded, that there was one new point, and if there was nothing to set, I'll push it another generation forwards. OK, it's now making lines. It found two new types of line. They must have been like this. A joined to B, C, D, E. So that's allowed, isn't it? And I could do B, C, D, E joined to something like A, D, C, E, I think. It, in front of the board, I can't quite think whether that's trivial or not. I suspect that's the other. Anyway, it found two new types of lines it had nothing else to say to me. So far, this isn't a great success. The computer's told us no theorems at all. Let's push it one step further to generation five, and at generation five, something happens. So it discovers its first theorems. Um, so let's have a, it, it found two theorems. It, you know, at generation five, there's five new types of points, and they include two theorems. So let's read the first theorem and see what the computer says. Because I got really excited by this theorem. I got excited enough to call John Conway, who was also excited by it. So it's telling us that the object A, what is it? A, C, D, E, so this is a line, and I've got another line, B, A, D, C, E, so it says, 
this line is unchanged when you permute some of the points, and it was unable to predict that combinatorial. It's, it's saying it found a combinatorial count of 60 elements. It thought the combinatorial stabilizer had size 2, but the geometric stabilizer has size 6. And here are some extra permutations that fix this object and that were not predictable combinatorial. These are geometric facts. So B, E, C, D. And it does another one too. It's stabilized by B, E, C, D. I, I want to understand this from a human perspective. So when we look at it, I forgot the pointy brackets around the outside. We are intersecting two lines, L and M. This is so disgusting, let's call it L. <laughs> and this is M. Okay, if I apply that permutation, I'm going to get another pair of lines. B, E, C, D. B, E, C, D. It swaps these two things, and so it actually fixes this line, doesn't it? So the other pair is L and something here, M. So this is L, this is M, and N is E. B, E, C, D, A, C, D, B. So it's telling me the point of intersection of L and M is the same as the point of intersection of L and M. Okay? I don't think that's trivial. Maybe you do. Maybe you can see that L, that maybe you can see that M and N are the same line, in which case it's trivial. But you can't see that because it's not the case. My program isn't that stupid. <laughs> um, it, I, later I can tell you why I know for sure that's not the case, but it isn't the case. So this is a non-trivial fact, and what it's really telling us is L, M, and M concurrent. L and M meet at a point, L and M meet at the same point. All three lines run from the same point. That's a slightly more human way to see this theorem. And now, let's try and draw the theorem. I, but okay, the reason I was so excited by this theorem is Pappus is well known to be the simplest incidence theorem in projective geometry. And Pappus' theorem uses six ingredients. <laughs> and I've got my computer, I should say, has given me an incidence theorem with five ingredients. That's why I called John Conway and why we both had a good look at it. And this is what we discovered. This is a machine's first pair. Is this a new human? Or somebody came up with it before? I don't know very much projective geometry. So I, I can answer that question. You believe what? Nice. You. Well, let's have a look at this. A, B, C, D, E. Okay, what are we talking about? There's a line L that joins A to B, C, D, E. B, C, D, E. Here's the line L. Okay, there's a line M that joins B to A, D, C, E. that joins E to A, C, B, D. A, whatever it was, A, C, D, B, D. 